Our scripture this morning comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. It says, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, God, our rock and our redeemer. I pray that because of me, or even in spite of me, this morning your word would be faithfully proclaimed. Amen. Um, so I guess this Sunday is already starting off a little bit better than last Sunday since I haven't dropped my um, podium <laughs> pieces um, Last week, if you were here, this um, I didn't correctly slide the thing down, um, but I did change it back to red, um, despite it no longer being Pentecost. I thought we could use a little extra Holy Spirit, and the red pyramids just don't get used nearly enough. Um, but if, if you were asked to define hope, thinking of our scripture, um, hope is mentioned in there, if you were asked to define the word hope, what would you say? Like, would you talk about a sense of expectation, or longing for a certain thing to happen, kind of like, I don't know, when you were a kid, you hoped you might get dessert later that day, like, I really want that to happen, so you hope for it. Um, that's kind of how the new Oxford American Dictionary defines hope. Um, that definition has then two subpoints that help nuance how we understand the word hope. Um, it says that hope can be related to a person or thing um, that may help save someone, it can also be the grounds for believing that something good may happen. Um, but good old Merriam-Webster breaks it down a little bit differently, um, and they actually have separate entries for hope as a verb and hope as a noun. Um, the verb hope, so to hope for something, means to cherish a desire with anticipation, to want something to happen or be true. And then the noun hope, means a desire accompanied by expectation of or belief in fulfillment of success. Um, if you didn't already know this, like I'm a big nerd, so I, I genuinely appreciate being able to look at these various definitions and like the, the slight differences and how it changes how we understand the meaning. Like I love looking up definitions of words um, and how each one is a little bit distinct. I know, I'm a nerd. Um, and it's not that any of, these definitions is the quote-unquote right one. Um, instead, it's kind of like um, a diamond where there are all these different little facets that illuminate different beautiful, different beautiful parts of what it means to hope. Um, you could say the same thing for many different words, like there's all these different nuances, all these different angles and parts of the words that we say. And of course, even as I, I dig into these different nuances of how we define hope, I realized that we could easily do the same thing for almost any of the words in our scripture. Like you could look at suffering, endurance, character. You could look at so many different words out of this scripture from Romans. But fear not, though I am a nerd, um, even though we could sit here all day and hear the many definitions of all of these different powerful words, we aren't going to do that. Um, I like to think if I ever did a complete sermon where I was just listing off definitions of words that someone would be like, let me just stop you there. Like, can we all, <laughs> like, it's okay, like the old time, like, gong show. Like, if I ever start just reading out of a dictionary, just gong me on out. Um, there probably isn't enough coffee or sun drop in the world to make a Sunday morning sermon of a bunch of dictionary definitions interesting. Um, that kind of sermon could easily bore us to tears and maybe even put a lot of us to sleep. Um, but I bring up the word hope. I looked at that one in particular, and that's the anchor I want us to hold on to as we explore this text from Romans more deeply. Because I think hope is the thing that ties this scripture together. It tethers the many lessons from our scripture together into one, like, complete thing. Holding hope, then, as the sinner of our heart and focus, let's look more closely at this scripture 
passage from Romans 5. I know it's short, but there's still a lot in there. So Romans is one of many different letters in the New Testament. Along with books like Philemon, 1 Corinthians, and Galatians, it's a letter that Paul wrote to the community of Romans. Um, and Paul was writing to the Christians who were residing in Rome during the first century. And in this letter, Paul outlines the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. Um, he outlines the message that's given to us in the Gospels. And Romans 5 in particular is talking about the results of justification, which is just a big word that means being made right with God. Justification is being made right with God. And our reading from Romans 5 is unique because it's one of a relatively small number of passages that I can think of where all three persons of the Trinity are mentioned. And that's perfect um, because this morning is actually known in the liturgical calendar as Trinity Sunday. So I noted the red pyramids because traditionally Trinity Sunday, I would have switched them to white before we get a long, long season of green all the way until Advent. Given the long season of green until Advent, I was like, we're going to stay red for a little while because that's still the Holy Spirit and that's one of the persons of the Trinity. Um, but as the name implies, Trinity Sunday... Um, it's a Sunday when we traditionally intentionally remember um, the dynamic interwoven nature of the Trinitarian God we put our faith in and the God that we worship. I um, mean, Trinity Sunday is a little unique too in the liturgical calendar because if you think of so many of the other um, church holidays, so to speak, that we celebrate, things like Pentecost or even the season of Advent leading up to Christmas, um, the baptism of the Lord, like all of those were events that took place. Like it was an event, it was a festival, some sort of celebration. But the Trinity's sort of different because we're talking about like a doctrine or like a, a belief. Like it's a, it's a Sunday dev devoted to a, a principle that we, we believe in. And I think the Trinity Sunday is important because so often we, we don't talk enough about the Holy Spirit in the church. Um, sometimes it gets maybe one Sunday, like Pentecost, we typically talk about the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, uh, or maybe we get a couple services dedicated to it in the church year. Um, it's it's kind of sad. We, we kind of leave out the, um, the Holy Spirit sometimes, but even more than that, like how crazy is it? Say we give the Holy Spirit one to two Sundays really intentionally, but we give the Trinity one Sunday each year, if that, um, and that seems crazy because trying to understand and explain the Trinity, um, to explain the Holy Spirit is like, it's trying to understand advanced calculus. Like if regular beliefs were like basic algebra, like the Trinity is like calculus. It's confusing. It defies our expectations of how things work because at the heart of our belief in the Trinity is the idea that God exists and is present in the world as three distinct persons. But though we proclaim that there are these three persons of the Trinity, they're all one. We believe in one God in three persons, which is confusing for a lot of people who are new to church or religion, um, or maybe even if you've grown up in the church, the Trinity is still kind of confusing because anywhere else in the world, one plus one plus one equals Three, not one. But the belief in the Trinity is that one, 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 three persons are still all one. But what I actually think is great news for us is that no matter where we are on our faith journey, um, our inability to fully understand the Trinity does not preclude us from having faith. In fact, I've often heard people tell me that if you ever get to the point where you think to yourself, I completely understand the Trinity. I get it. Then you probably need to just start back at square one because you probably, like, like it, it will completely continue to defy our understanding, our complete, under, our complete understanding. But that's the beauty of it. We can always be growing in our understanding of it. We can still have faith even though we can't fully explain the mystery of the, the Trinity and the God we love and worship. But looking at our verses from Romans, I think we do get some clues about the interactions between the various persons of the Trinity. Verse 1 tells us that we've been justified by faith. We have peace with God through Jesus. 
So this is reminding us that th through what Jesus did on the cross, when we have faith, our sins are forgiven, and our relationship with God is restored. So Jesus is that bridge that helps heal our relationship with God. And verse 2 goes on to tell us that through Christ we now stand in a place of grace. And we hope for the day when we will one day share in God's glory. And then verses 3 and 4 tell us how we can boast in our sufferings because we know that they produce endurance, which produces character, which produces hope. And then verse 5 wraps us by telling us that we can hope, that when we hope, hope will not disappoint us because we've been given the gift of God's love through the sending of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit then is how we experience and know God's great love for us, how we remember how the love, that love bought our salvation through Jesus Christ. Um, or if we think of back to Trinity Sunday when we talked about the ascension, the Holy Spirit is our advocate. It's our continued presence since Jesus is no longer bodily present with us. The Holy Spirit um, is now with us to help us interact with God, to help our connection to God. So as we think about this scripture as a whole, as I noted, it mentions each of the persons of the Trinity. It mentions a lot of these powerful words like endurance, character, and hope. And I know that I'm struck with this scripture, just how much truth and power that Paul was able to cram into such few verses. He captures the belief that we're justified by our faith in Christ. We're made right with God through believing in Jesus. Paul also captures the belief that we have constant access to grace. Paul even captures that how what we see in Christ and his journey to the cross can teach us how then to walk through our own difficult seasons of life. And that last bit is, it's a hard truth to swallow sometimes. That's the hardest part about this scripture to me, that note about boasting in our sufferings. Paul's suggesting that we can boast in our sufferings, it's certainly unconventional. It's definitely countercultural. Um, our world often seems to point us more towards wallowing in our suffering rather than boasting in it. Sometimes in the face of suffering, the thought of having a pity party and curling up with a blanket and some ice cream sounds way better than the optimistic, hopeful response that we probably should have, like the hopeful response of glorying or boasting in our sufferings. Like that's, that's sort of hard to do. But here's the thing, I don't actually think Paul is trying to draw a hard line in the sand and saying it's either this or that. Like it's either wallowing or boasting. We can acknowledge when things are hard. We can acknowledge when things feel overwhelming, when we feel lost. In fact, if you think about it, to even call it suffering, at some level you have to admit that what you're going through is difficult, painful, or trying. Otherwise, you wouldn't call it suffering in the first place. And there's, there's actually a lot of power in doing that. There's power in lament, power in bringing our broken hearts to God. In fact, the Psalms are filled with prayers of, of lament when David cried out to God for rescue. So Paul is not telling us to just ignore um, the hard parts of life or the reality of suffering. He's just telling us we can't stay there. Paul, what Paul wants us to do, he wants to see our suffering through eyes of faith, which is ultimately saying that Paul wants us to see our suffering through eyes of hope. Because no matter how bad things get, no matter how dark things seem, there is always, always hope. Even in the face of death, we still have hope because we know that death is never the end. There's still hope because of the good news that Paul outlined, that we're justified by Christ, at peace with God, and loved through the Holy Spirit. Those are unshakable, unchangeable, and unbreakable promises that God has given us. Those promises are the source of our ongoing hope. The promises of God are our hope when things are going well, when things are sort of meh, when things are chaotic, and even when things seem like they're falling apart. God is still our hope in all of those situations. 
So we can lift up prayers of lament sometimes. In fact, we can and must bring our broken hearts to God because we're reminded again and again that God is right there with us. God is with us in the highs and the lows all the same. That's the power to me of Scripture's shortest verse, the verse Jesus wept, always a favorite one to memorize back in uh, middle school days. But the power of that verse, the power of the notion that Jesus wept, is it reminds us that when we grieve, when we find ourselves weeping, Christ is grieving along with us, right by our side. So we can lament the pains that we carry, all while holding on to hope because we know that God is with us. We know that God works everything together for good. So though our pain and sorrow may last through the night, we can rejoice because joy comes in the morning. Each new day, each new morning is an opportunity to experience joy. Each day is a new beginning. So may these truths bring us hope and assurance no matter what season of life we find ourselves in. May we encounter and know the hope of loving our God, the God who makes all things new. In the face of suffering, may God grant us endurance. May we grow stronger in our character. And in all things, may we cling to the hope of God, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs>